What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Today's topic is about how to avoid oxidation of your beer in every step of the brewing process. Now some of the things that I'm going to talk about in this video are hotly debated in the homebrew community uh, and in the brewing community at large and may rub some people the wrong way. I want to point out that it is absolutely okay to disagree. Having disagreements and debate makes us all smarter so long as we are actually good about how we talk about it. So whether or not you think hot side aeration is a thing, whether or not you're a biochemist or just somebody who likes to make beer on the side. We're all just homebrewers, we're all just beer makers, so let's keep it civil, all right? So in this video, I'm going to be answering questions like, is hot side aeration real? Why is oxygen a bad thing when you actually deliberately add oxygen to a beer sometimes? How do I dry hop a hazy IPA without oxidizing it? What if I don't have a fancy conical fermenter? What can I do to avoid oxidation? All of these questions are going to be answered in this video, I hope, so let's dive into it. The first thing I want to talk about is what is the risk of oxidation? Why is that a bad thing for beer? So the short answer is oxidation is going to stale your beer faster than anything else. The most famous examples are light lagers and New England IPAs. A hazy IPA is going to typically be like a bright pale color, nice and hazy, beautiful, lots of hop aroma and really juicy flavors. However, it's not that uncommon to experience an oxidized hazy IPA just simply because it's pretty much the most vulnerable beer to oxidation out of them all. And oxidized hazy IPAs smell bland, they look brown or purple, and they just don't taste good. There's not really all that much hop character there, and it just generally tastes off. Some people probably also had stale pale lagers as well, which taste just boring, cardboardy, papery, just not good. Exposing your beer to oxygen really shortens its shelf life significantly. It causes color changes, it causes flavor degradation, just a host of bad things. We generally want to avoid it, right? Now, one single molecule of oxygen entering your fermenter isn't going to ruin your beer. You, many people, including myself, have made plenty of great hazy IPAs that have stayed good for a long time and have pulled the lid off the fermenter during the fermentation to throw some dry hops in. It's, you're good. A lot of people really obsess over getting oxygen into their beers, rightly so, but it's not the end of the world if something goes wrong. Always remember to relax, don't worry, and have a homebrew. One of the most common questions that I get about oxidation is, why is oxygen a bad thing when I'm deliberately aerating the wort prior to fermentation? And the answer really is, oxygen is critical in the short term reproduction cycle of yeast during the primary fermentation. Yeast will consume oxygen in order to split cells and reproduce during the early stages of fermentation where fermentation is active and Krausen is forming on the beer and their airlock is going crazy. Yeast are consuming oxygen very, very rapidly. That's why we add oxygen by aerating or adding pure O2 right before we pitch our yeast. So after the primary fermentation is complete and the yeast have gone through the reproduction cycle and they started to move into a secondary fermentation, they've flocculated out and sat to the bottom of the fermenter. That's when the beer is vulnerable to oxidation. The yeast are finished fermentation. They need oxygen and sugar in order to reproduce and create CO2. Without sugar, oxygen starts to dissolve into the beer, starts to bind to different compounds, flavor compounds usually in the beer, causing that staling issue. And that's why I wanna draw that line there. Oxygen before primary fermentation is okay. Oxygen after primary fermentation is not. But now we wanna talk about how does oxygen get into the beer in the first place? And we're gonna split this into two sides. The hot side, which is basically the mash, the boil, everything before you pitch your yeast, and the cold side, after you chill everything down, pitch your yeast, uh, move on to fermentation, packaging, serving the beer. That's all cold side. So hot side. And here comes the question. Is hot side aeration real? The answer is undoubtedly yes. Now, that's going to piss some people off. I've routinely said hot side aeration doesn't matter. I've routinely said hot side aeration is not something you need to worry about. I've routinely said the effects of hot side aeration on homebrewed beer is a myth. And I stand by that. How can that possibly exist when I say hot side aeration is real? Hot side aeration is indeed real. Oxygen molecules, when wort is hot, will bind to compounds in the beer and they can cause oxidation of the beer in that case. Hot side aeration typically occurs most in, in the mash temperature zone. When you get below that, oxygen doesn't really go in and bind with things, it just dissolves separately into the wort. That's another reason why aerating your wort prior to pitching the yeast when you've chilled it uh, isn't a concern for oxidation. However, 
On the homebrew scale, this is not a big deal. This is a much, much bigger deal for somebody who is a commercial brewer who's brewing in several barrel size batches, who's making beer for selling and for consistency. That is where this starts to really come into play. The reason why I say it doesn't matter for the home brewer is because there have been multiple experiments out there, including those from Brewlosophy, where people have deliberately hot side aerated the crap out of beers that are very sensitive to oxygen, and they put them up against beers that have not had any sort of aeration at all applied to them on the hot side and there's no difference. The system that I use, the Glawhammer Supply System, has a spray valve which literally causes an enormous amount of hot side aeration. There's a foam that appears above the mash. I have a Czech Pilsner that I have continued to age a year later. It continues to be bright, super pale, hoppy and clean and beautifully flavored and absolutely no signs of oxidation. How could this possibly happen? That is the main reason why I don't care about hot side aeration at the homebrew level. There's another place where oxygen can make it into your beer uh, on the hot side that we didn't talk about yet, and that's due to something called ROS, or reactive oxygen species. Uh, what this is essentially is a fancy term for chemicals uh, and compounds that enable oxidation later on down the road. Now the level of ROS in your work can change depending on what kinds of brewing methods you're using, depending on what kinds of grains you're using. Typically when you're brewing with flaked adjuncts like flaked wheat or flaked oats, that tends to increase the level of ROS that get created during the mashing process. Flaked oats actually are the biggest culprit of it. Now the creation of reactive oxygen species are actually easily countered, but we'll talk about that later. But if you don't do anything about it, it can cause an additional uh, risk of oxidation later on down the road. Now, when you split the cold side, that's really where people talk about this a lot more. The risk of cold side oxidation really comes around when you're uh, opening up your fermenter for extended periods of time. Basically, if you're exposing the beer to the air after the fermentation is completed for like a minute or longer, that's when you really start to risk that cold side oxidation, which is arguably significantly more impactful to the shelf life of a beer than hot side oxidation. So now let's get into the meat and potatoes of this video, which is how do you actually go about reducing the risks of oxidation in your brewing? If you really want to get into super low oxygen brewing and you really want to minimize the amount of uh, risks that you're taking with oxidation, then here's some methods that you can use. So again, we'll do this hot side and then cold side. Basically, you want to avoid splashing the wort in any way when it's warm. So when you're mashing, you're not going to recirculate or you're just going to recirculate very gently or through like a sparge manifold that rests on top of the wort. If you're transferring from mash down to boil kettle, you're going to want to use a hose that's submerged and doesn't splash, things like that. Again, I will mention I still have had zero evidence of hot side aeration in all of my beers and they have used a very, very high aerating spray nozzle, basically. <laughs> um, so yeah. If you're brewing with a high percentage of flaked grains like flaked oats and flaked wheat, consider splitting that like down to 50-50 flaked grains and malted versions of the same thing. So if you got like 40% flaked oats in a hazy, maybe do 20% flaked oats and 20% malted oats. Basically the malted version of these don't have the same level of uh, metals in them that cause ROS to be formed in the beer. And generally when you're using the malted versions of these, you're gonna get about the same level of proteins, haze, and flavors that you would get from the flaked side. On the same topic of ROS, here's how you reduce ROS. Credit for this technique always is gonna to go to Genus Brewing. They're the ones I learned it from, and it's a great technique. And that is adding three to five grams of ascorbic acid during your mash. What this does is it prevents the ROS from being formed in the first place, uh, and then therefore drastically reduces the amount of oxidation that happens down the road. Sorbic acid has no effect on mash pH, and it really has no flavor impact whatsoever other than really helping your beer in the long run. It's a very easy thing to do, and it really does help with the shelf life. That is one of the reasons why that Czech Pilsner has lasted as long as it did. And lastly, if you have significant melanoidin levels in your beer, uh, such as what you would get from a decoction mash or a very long boil, this is gonna significantly reduce ROS as well and give you a longer beer shelf life. Again, credit goes to Genius Brewing on this one. They really know what they're talking about when it comes to this stuff. Peter is actually a biochemist. So now let's get into what home brewers really are gonna wanna care about the most, and that's cold side oxidation. So on the cold side, CO2 is your absolute best friend. 
Even if you don't keg, having a CO2 tank on standby is one of the most useful things because you can use it to purge headspace out of your fermenter, you can use it to purge headspace out of bottles, and you can use it to just control your fermentation in certain ways. Even if you have a bucket fermenter and you just stick a, a carb stone on the end of a CO2 line into your fermenter to just purge the headspace of that bucket fermenter as you're dry hopping, that's gonna do wonders for you. So speaking of dry hopping, I have a separate video on how to dry hop oxygen free. I will link that up here in the corner, but there's a few techniques on dry hopping I wanna cover here in this video. The first is to just do all of your dry hopping during the primary fermentation when activity Activity is at its highest and you have Krausen. You can make a great New England IPA by simply dry hopping during the active phase and never opening your fermenter after that again. It does work that way. You're not gonna have uh, the exact same flavor complexity that you would have with a two or three stage dry hop uh, and where you dry hop once during fermentation and once after fermentation or more, but you still get 90% of the flavor in that way and it still makes a damn good New England IPA. Using that method means you don't have to worry about oxidation of your beer through dry hopping. The second option you have is using a magnet technique. So if you have food grade magnets, you can use those to hold up a bag of dry hops underneath the lid of your fermenter. So this works great on bucket style fermenters. So basically you put the dry hops in there, you put a magnet in the bag, you get these little uh, food grade magnets that you can use inside the fermentation, they're not gonna corrode on you. And then you put a stack of magnets on the other side of the lid. So basically you have this bag being held up underneath the lid of the fermenter. And as fermentation begins, CO2 floods that area. It keeps the hops from staling uh, over the first day or so and then when you're ready to dry hop all you do is pull the outer stack of magnets off the lid and the bag of dry hops falls into the fermenter and that way you can dry hop on a schedule with multiple dry hopping additions without ever opening your fermenter. There's also much more expensive options especially geared towards those of us that have conical fermenters or something with like a tri-clamp lid. Uh, you can use something like a hop dropper in that case to have an oxygen free dry hop as well. There's a lot of different ways that you can do that. Another option is if you have a conical fermenter or just some other fermenter with a bottom valve you can actually hook a CO2 line up to that. You can bubble CO2 up through your beer and then just straight up take the lid off and add your hops that way or add other adjuncts to the beer that way um, without risk of oxygen exposure. Because you're actually bubbling CO2 through there, you're pushing oxygen out of the fermenter as you add things to it. It's a very, very risk-free method uh, for doing that sort of thing. You can also ferment in a keg or you can ferment under pressure. These are just ways to guarantee that you don't get oxygen in your beer at all during fermentation. You can use a variation of a firmzilla, you can use a uh, keg for this, uh, or you can use a steel unit tank. You're also going to want to avoid splashing the beer around inside the fermenter. Uh, so if you are one of those people that needs to move fermenters around or like take them up and down stairs or something like that, I would advise not doing that if you can avoid it. Splashing the beer around is a slight risk for oxidation. I wouldn't say it's a significant one, but it's a slight one. So just try to avoid that. The next spot where there's the most risk of oxidation is actually during a cold crash. You don't really always need to cold crash beer. It's a nice technique to try and clarify it faster or to drop things like hop debris out. I usually just end up cold crashing in the keg and using a floating dip tube most of the time. But if you want to cold crash in the fermenter, just be aware that as you lower that temperature inside the fermenter, it's going to cause a pressure differential which will suck air in. Typically, it'll suck the sanitizer in the airlock in and then the air behind it. Um, so there's a couple different ways you can avoid this if you absolutely have to cold crash. The first is to basically pressurize the fermenter. If you have a pressure capable fermenter, basically add 10 to 15 PSI on top of the beer before you cold crash. That way it absorbs the CO2 in the headspace instead of oxygen and you don't pull anything in. Another method that's a little bit easier, I think, is just to hook up a CO2 line to your fermenter's airlock or headspace with a very very low amount of pressure on it, like one or two PSI, which you can do with any fermenter. That way, again, you fill the headspace with CO2 instead of oxygen, and as that pressure differential changes, you're just adding CO2 instead of oxygen to the beer, and you don't have to worry about sanitizer suck back either. The final spot where oxidation is a really big hazard, and I think this is possibly where most home brewers actually end up introducing oxygen into their beers, is during packaging. If you're kegging or if you're moving to a separate vessel of some kind, if you're performing any kind of transfer, to avoid oxidation, you should really use a closed transfer or a semi-closed transfer. A closed transfer is how I will typically keg every single beer. So when it comes time to keg, I'll clean that keg 
and then I'll fill it with sanitizer solution all the way up, all full five gallons. I'll close the keg, hook up a CO2 line, and push all of that sanitizer out of the keg and into like a bucket or something. And then once you remove that CO2 line, the only thing inside that keg is CO2. So then I'll take my fermenter, I'll hook a CO2 line up to the top of the fermenter, I'll hook a jumper cable, which is basically a liquid to liquid line, from the fermenter to the liquid post on the keg. And then I will vent the CO2 out of the top of the keg. This is not a full close transfer, a full close transfer is actually a loop, but it doesn't matter all that much because you're actually just pushing CO2 out and you're just adding CO2 to the fermenter. So what happens is you're adding CO2 to the fermenter, which is pushing the beer through that closed line into the keg, that pushes it through the liquid dip tube to avoid splashing, filling from the bottom up, pushing CO2 out of the keg and into the environment. I would highly recommend making sure that your jumper line is empty of oxygen when you do this, because that is a way to pick it up. This way, you never have that beer touching oxygen when you're kegging. After that, of course, I will purge the headspace in the keg with CO2 anyway, just to be very sure of it. Even if you're bottling though, there's plenty of ways to reduce oxidation. The first is to not use a bottling bucket. Just put that away, don't use it at all. If you have an open bucket where you put your beer in and then you're bottling from that bucket, you are exposing it to oxygen the entire time, which is bad, don't do that. If you absolutely must, Try finding a way to add CO2 to the top of that bucket and keep that headspace clear. Uh, that is really the best thing you can do, but there's plenty of better ways to do it. The easiest way to fix this problem is to just to use a fermenter that has a pickup tube or a dip tube that sits above the tube, something like the anvil bucket, for example, that you can bottle from. If you bottle directly from the spigot at the bottom of the fermenter, you're not pulling oxygen into your bottles. Now, I wouldn't be using your typical homebrew starter kit bottling wand when you do this, though. I would actually look into using a beer gun of some kind to bottle with. So something like Northern Brewer's Last Straw or the Blickman beer gun, something that you can purge the bottles with CO2 with prior to filling them with beer. When you purge the bottle of CO2 and you fill that beer all the way up, the last thing you want to do is remove your bottling wand and then give it a spray of CO2 right before you cap it in order to clean that headspace, clear up any oxygen that's in there and avoid future oxidation from the headspace. And lastly, if you're bottle conditioning and you're adding priming sugar and bottling yeast when you're actually packaging your beer, that will help tremendously in getting rid of any oxygen in the bottle. It's not really a foolproof method. It can still result in oxidation, so I wouldn't depend on bottle conditioning purely to get rid of oxidation. However, you can still purge the headspace with a little blast of CO2 prior to capping, even if you're bottle conditioning, and that will get you the results that you need. I hope this video has been helpful to you though. It's a dense topic. Let me know if you still have any questions in the comments. I will do my best to answer them. There's a thousand different ways to get oxygen out of your beer, and there's plenty of people out there who have different techniques, so feel free to share yours as well. Again, I fully expect that I'm starting a fight with the hot side aeration piece. It's a very touchy topic, and home brewing, but without talking about it, we don't really get any smarter. So just, I ask, please be civil in the comments having your discourses about it. If you like the video, please hit that like button, hit that subscribe button if you haven't already and share if you can. It does mean a lot to me and it costs you nothing. If you wanna support the channel, there's a number of ways to do so. I have a t-shirt store in the description box where you can get this t-shirt and many others like it. It's a great way to help support me. I get about 30% of that sticker price, so check one out. I also have a Patreon. My Patreon supporters are the people that are really helping increase the production quality of this channel. You guys have already enabled me to pay for a great editing software and it's really making a huge difference for me in my video editing process, so thank you for that. I also have channel memberships now for just a couple bucks a month. You hit that join button next to the subscribe button, you get some perks, you get to stand out from everyone else in the comments section, so check it out if you're interested. I also have an Amazon store. On that store, I have a whole bunch of equipment that I've used before. If it's available on Amazon and I've used it and I recommend it, it's gonna be on that store. So check that out for some easy stuff. I also have an Instagram. If you wanna follow me on more than just YouTube, that's at the apartment brewer on Instagram. There I'll post a little bit more frequently uh, where we talk a little bit more about what's coming to the channel and you get to see some brewing stuff too. Last but certainly not least, thank you for being here. If you're still here, I appreciate you watching to the end. And until the next one, Cheers.